Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold Christ in all his redeeming work. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This is my last weekend with you all at St. Paul's, and as I'm wrapping up my time at seminary, I've been thinking a lot about endings. Now, I love a good post-credit scene. You're at the movies, and you've just finished a satisfying tale, and you watch the final credits, and then there is one more scene, one more glimpse into the story to perhaps revisit a favorite character or to extend the story in some way, to orient you the next installment of your favorite superhero franchise. That's exactly what we have in today's Gospel reading. Scholars agree that John's Gospel originally ended in chapter 20. The early Johannine community slipped in this post-credit scene. They realized there was more of the story to tell. There was a little bit more that needed to happen so that we could be oriented for what is to come. This makes sense to me because even though the disciples knew that Jesus had defeated death, even though Jesus had appeared to them twice, they still didn't really know what to do. It was Peter who suggested that they made fi- that they would go fishing. And don't we do that too? When life is all topsy-turvy, we want to take comfort in something familiar, something that makes sense. And so Peter and the rest of the disciples hop into the fishing boat. But while they're on the fishing boat, Jesus is fixing breakfast on the shore. And that's where the meat of this story is literally. So our post credit scene continues. When Peter makes his way to the beach, something gut-wrenching happens. Jesus is cooking over a charcoal fire. Charcoal. Now this is not a detail that John threw in for a little bit of literary flair. This word, charcoal, only appears twice in John's Gospel. The other time is in the courtyard of the high priest, which is where Peter denies Jesus three times. The slaves and the temple police are gathered over a charcoal fire. So as Peter draws near and the smell fills his nostrils, he and we are transported back to this earlier scene. Now, this cannot feel great for Peter to revisit what is likely one of the toughest days of his life. And this, at first, does not seem like good news. Just like in the high priest's courtyard, Jesus asks Peter three questions, and you can feel the tension in this story rising. We are in a tender place. We are in the place of Peter's failure. We get right up to the edge of this harsh memory, and Jesus doesn't rub it in. It's not about revenge, you see. It's not about keeping score. He brings us up to the most painful memory of Peter's life, the one that causes him to cry out in exasperation, Lord, you know everything. And he implied, you know what I did and how badly I feel about it. And Jesus says, okay. Rather than offering Peter words of rebuke, he offers him fish and bread. And then he says, now go and do likewise. He gives him a job to do. He says, go and feed my sheep. Just as Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus gives Peter three chances to revisit this memory. Jesus helps Peter rewrite this memory and orient him to a new future. This new future, this new way of being in the world is not based on revenge or just deserts, but about hope and grace and mercy and being freed from those things that keep us in bondage. In the words of our collects today, Jesus opened the eyes of Peter's faith that he might behold Christ in all his redeeming work. Now, this redeeming work, this unconditional embrace, is so hard for us to understand. In fact, it's nonsense, according to the ways of this world. The idea that God offers all of us love and mercy in equal measure is almost impossible for us to grasp. This gospel truth that no one is beyond the reach of God's forgiveness 
is especially hard to hear in the wake of recent news. It is evil to attack a synagogue or a college campus and murder people. It is evil to bomb churches on Easter Sunday and cut short the lives of hundreds of people. It is evil to bomb black churches in Louisiana in the false name of white supremacy. And let me be perfectly clear, I am not excusing these actions. They are unconscionable. And I know that God weeps with us when our hearts break anew at the news of yet another horrific tragedy. Yet, our Christian faith also teaches us that no one is beyond the mercy of God. No one. And to be perfectly honest, this gospel truth baffles me. I don't want forgiveness or mercy. My instinct teaches me that if you do something good, you should be rewarded. If you do something bad, you should be punished. But that is not the way of Jesus. Jesus is not like me in ways that challenge and expand my imagination. They stretch the boundaries of what I think is possible. I heard a story recently that opened up this gospel truth for me in a new way, and I want to share it with you now. There was a little girl about five years old, and her mom, who lived on the coast of Oregon, bounced from house to house. The mom was an alcoholic, and with the last of her money, he paid rent for a little motel room with a kitchenette and bought a sack of potatoes. They ate nothing but potatoes for a month. When the potatoes ran out, the little girl and her mother went door to door in their motel complex, asking for something to eat. At the first door, a woman named Anita opened up. As Anita stood in front of the door, the little girl peeked around her and she could see a beautiful table spread with pot roast and green beans and mashed potatoes that Anita had somehow conjured up in her motel kitchen. The mother asked for something, some food, and Anita, without saying anything, walked over to the table, packed up her supper, and handed it to the mom. Anita could have turned this pear away. She could have gone to the cupboard and made them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and that would have been enough. But she didn't. She gave them pot roast and green beans. She later helped this mom find a job at a local diner. She helped this family turn their life around. She showed kindness and mercy. In that moment, Anita, like Peter, followed in the footsteps of Jesus. She opened her eyes to behold and to participate in God's redeeming work. And that's the good news of Easter, is it not? That God's redeeming work is alive and well over a meal of fish and bread on a beach in Galilee, at a motel in Oregon, right here, right now. My friends, the good news is that Anita is a lot like our God. The good news is that the name of God is mercy. The name of God is mercy. Our God is not in the business of keeping score. Our God is in the business of welcome embrace, forgiveness. As my favorite hymn reminds us, there's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. None of us, not a single one, is reduced to the worst thing we have done. None of us, not a single one, is abandoned in our shame. None of us, not a single one, is ineligible for God's mercy. None of us, not a single one, is beyond the reach of God's redeeming love. That is the scandal of the gospel. God meets us with unfailing mercy no matter who we are, no matter what we have done, no matter what. And just when you think you're doing it wrong, that you're not as faithful or as holy or as true or as good as the person sitting in the pew next to you, that this message of hope and reconciliation can't possibly be for you, well, I think today's gospel story invites you to reconsider. As our story today reminds us, it's precisely when you feel the need to 
run and hide from God's mercy. It is precisely when you feel the need to get on that fishing boat that you are exactly God's cup of tea. My friends, the story is not over. We are each in the midst of our own post-credit scene. God is opening up the door to us, offering us a pot roast and a side of green beans, or a meal of fish and bread. Will you open your eyes and behold Christ in all his redeeming work? Will you taste and see that the Lord is good? I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.